sweets on your Lambeth way. Any evening, any day, you'll find us all. Hello and welcome to the first of my uh, tailored Jules Guides London walks and over the next few weeks I'll be suggesting a few routes that you can take and selecting some of my favourite videos that can explain some of the fun stuff that you can see along the way. This week, why not take a walk around St James's Palace? From Green Park Station, make your way up Piccadilly and then turn right on St James's Street. Doing the Lambeth walk. Pickering Place. This is really nice actually. I, I really like it in here. This is apparently the smallest open space, public open space in London, whatever that means. And actually, I think famously it's supposed to be the place where the last public duel was fought. Is that right? What? Was this the last place where a duel was fought publicly yeah. in London? Oh, they didn't tell them. Take that. It was definitely happened here though, didn't it? It was, yeah. The yeah. Last place that these are the original gas lamps from the period, I think. It's about the last place in London where you can still find them. I think they've got some over there as well, near St James's Palace. I can just imagine it's a perfect little place for someone to take offence at somebody's indiscretion and challenge them for a duel out in the courtyard here. This is the original wood panelling from uh, 18th century. You can see something quite interesting on the wall. Texas in America, there used to be a republic and they used to have a Texas legation was here. It was sort of like a bit like an embassy between the years of 1842 and 1845. They actually had their legation here in Berry Brothers and Rudd, which is the famous old wine shop next door. Interestingly, one of the oldest wine shops in the world. Fill me a glass to ease the pain. I want the finest wines known to humanity. I want them here and I want them now. And by lucky hat, it's just a couple of steps to Berry Brothers and Rudd, one of the oldest wine shops in the world, apparently. We are the oldest wine merchant in the UK, still a family-owned and family-run business. Oh, gosh. In 1698, Berry Brothers was known as the coffee mill. To know your weight was a sign of well-being and something very fashionable. So at Berry Brothers, instead of getting rid of the scale, we did insert a seat and offer the service to weight our customers. From 1765, this is what we are doing. For example, George, from 1826, he was weighed with boots, a coat, a hat. Uh, we had the Agakan, Lord Byron, a French king on exile from France. So this telegram was sent on the 16th of <coughs> April of 1912 to let us know that uh, the Titanic had collided with an iceberg and sank. There are no mentions of the thousands of passengers who lost their lives. The only thing, we had 69 cases on board. <laughs> More worried about the wine. Yeah, now we go into the depths. Morning, Lance. When we have an important customer or a charity dinner, we have permission to use house reserve stock. We have some 1870 Pontecanet, 1919 Clos Blanc de Vougeot, 1899 Chateau Iquem. It's very kind of you, but I wouldn't drink before 12 o'clock. I'm assuming that the Queen probably gets a wine here. Absolutely, yeah. The Prince of Wales as well. Napoleon III in 1852 was on exile from France, was a very close friend of the Berries, who gave permission mission to host his private meetings. Burgundy, Bordeaux, Rhone, Japanese Sarkis. I quite fancy a drink after all that drink. So just around the corner from St James's Palace is Pall Mall and this is where a lot of London's gentlemen's clubs are. And a gentleman, as Oscar Wilde will tell you, is somebody who's never rude unintentionally. Number 79, actually, if we can just stop here. It's the only house on the whole street that doesn't belong to the Queen. Nell Gwynne was the mistress of King Charles II and she wanted a house near the palace, so he gave her this one. But when she discovered that she only owned a lease on it and didn't own the house outright, she went mental and she said that basically to the King that unless he gives her the freehold, She's off. She would not accept this house until it was conveyed free to her by an act of parliament. And from then on, it just got passed down through the family. This is the street, I believe, where the suffragettes came marching down when they were trying to get the votes for women. And of course, none of the men took any notice of them until they started smashing the windows of their clubs. And they said, oh, this is disgraceful, we have to do something about this. Blasted women smashing the windows of our club. Right, it's getting dark now, so the gas lamps should be coming on around near St James's Palace. They're mostly lit electronically now, but there are a few people from the gas board who come around and have to maintain them. If you get up really close to them, you can actually smell gas. And if you look on them, it says when they were installed. This one was in the reign of George IV. And on some of them, you can still see the round time mechanism. 
These are excellent. There's loads of them all over St. James's Park and Westminster and near Buckingham Palace. Really gives you a good Dickensian feeling. Actually, the first gas lamps were invented by a German called Albert Windsor around 1807. He put coal in an airtight box and warmed it up, and then gas would shoot up through hollow posts and you could light them like a big Bunsen burner. The pressure was often too much, so the only thing he could think of to string them all together were gun barrels. So he strung a whole load of them along here on the mall, and people actually got very scared when they first encountered them, so they never really took off. Perhaps his approach was slightly wrong. is the Grand Old Duke of York, as in the Grand Old Duke of York, who had 10,000 men. And as I march you up to the top of the hill, Simon, I'm not going to march you down again. Frederick, the Duke of York, who was the second son of King George III, the Mad King George, and he was the commander-in-chief of the, the British Army during the Napoleonic Wars. And uh, his brother, George, wanted a monument made to him, but unfortunately, no one liked him. He was quite famous for just not lounging around and uh, getting into debt. No one wanted to pay for the monuments. So without consulting government, they decided to dot the wages of every soldier in the British Army in order to finance the building of this monument, which, as you can imagine, did not go down particularly well. And so they put him all the way up there, so far up there, so that he could escape his debtors and also so that nobody would have to put up with the smell of the stinky duke. <laughs> Just a stone's throw from here, there's actually quite an interesting thing as well. Oh, Waterloo Place. Now, this is, that's Haymarket up there, isn't it? One of the many clubs around here is the Athenaeum or the Athenaeum. The Duke of Wellington was actually a member here, and you see this funny block here on the ground. He didn't want to have to jump to the ground off his horse every time he attended his club, so he had this block installed so he could dismount in a rather graceful manner. Actually, I've heard told that the Duke of Wellington is the first person credited with having worn trousers. Well, of course, back then it was all tights, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. They would have worn breeches. He was actually ejected from this club for doing so. Oh, there you are, sir. Wearing <laughs> trousers in here. Are you going in? No, I'm going to the RAC. Oh, oh okay. Well. Yeah. Ooh, Athenaeum, not good enough for him. <laughs> Here in Waterloo Place is a rather interesting little spot. Just over here at the bottom of this tree, next to number 9 Carlton House Terrace, which used to be the German Embassy, is a little really cute gravestone. It's the dog. He's called Giro. He belonged to the German ambassador. I see. Back in 1934, when the German embassy was next door, he had this little dog and it unfortunately chewed through some electric cables in the garden and was electrocuted. So he was buried here. here so that's a Nazi dog. dog. You don't have to say it. It's such a way. That's a Nazi that's a dog. dog. It's not the dog's fault. It's actually a bit unfair that it's known as the Nazi Dog Memorial because the ambassador, Leopold von Hirsch, wasn't really a Nazi. I mean, he was already the German ambassador when the Nazis came to power, and he actually strongly objected to their activities. In fact, he was so outspoken against the Nazis that they couldn't wait to get rid of him. Leopold von Hirsch was actually very popular amongst the British, and when he died, one of the oddest sights was his funeral in which his coffin was draped in a swastika flag and taken down these very steps past Buckingham Palace on a gun carriage with a proper military escort all the way to Dover and then taken over to Dresden where none of the Nazi party attended his funeral, which is rather sad. But inside, um, Albert Speer, Hitler's architect, was responsible for quite a lot of the design of the inside and Mussolini donated some marble. Actually, they tried to get rid of most of the swastikas, but they, I, think, I believe there is still a border of swastikas around one of the floors inside there. Ein treuer Begleiter. I don't know what it means. I think it means a trusty companion or something like that. I'm not sure how much that guy appreciated that, actually. It's not really a Nazi dog, though, is it? So because this is Admiralty Arch, you've got all these beautiful little boats on top of the lampposts. And that's why Captain Cook's over there as well, of course. All right, Julian, tell us about the arch. In 1905, they decided they wanted to build this Admiralty Arch, and they ran into a few problems because there were a couple of old ladies who used to bring their cow along here, and you could buy a glass of milk off these two old ladies. Anyway, the council sent down a couple of burly fellas to come and boot them out and uh, there was a big uproar everyone said wait a minute we like those ladies there selling milk from the cow's udder and eventually King Edward VII stepped in and said wait a minute I like those two old ladies I remember using them when I was a little boy 
and uh, then they carried on until their dying day, which probably wasn't very long afterwards, I should think. This building over here, I think this is the one that used to be a part of the Ministry of Defence or something. During the war, they actually had to try and disguise it. So they actually grew a lawn on top of the roof. La lawn still on the roof. There's still a lawn, yeah. lawn on the roof. Uh, the offices are all below ground. Right. It's now used under the heading of uh, MOD for HMS and Vincent. Five. Ministry of Defence, is. Yeah. Obviously, during the war, what happened? They used to have light like, passageways going to different government buildings. Yeah. Obviously, a lot of them are closed down now. Churchill used to have a room overlooking the Oscars. Yeah. And he was first sea lord. If you look around the other side, there's all this ivy. That used to go all the way around it so that the bombers couldn't see it from the air. Where are you off to? The Ritz. Well, oh, you look like you're going somewhere nice. Uh, no, I don't. You'd suit the Ritz, I think. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed your guided walk around St James's Palace. If you have, there'll be loads more guided walks coming up over the next few weeks. And if you like my videos, please hit the subscribe button. I've got loads more videos about London on my channel. And if you fancy a drink after finishing your walk, why not check out one of my playlists about London's most interesting bars and pubs. Thanks folks, see you next time.